Ja, nu ska ni vara hjärtligt välkomna hit till bokmässan Göteborg. Den del som heter Globala torget där vi organisationer samlas som jobbar på olika sätt med att försöka göra världen en smula bättre. Vi för ungefär hundra samtal här under de här dagarna på bokmässan. Ett av bokmässans tema är ju Sydafrika. Det har blivit belyst av många aspekter. Här ska vi ta upp en kanske mindre rolig del av Sydafrika, det utbredda våldet mot kvinnor. Men det är viktigt att den frågan blir uppmärksammad. Det är, rubriken heter Farligt att vara kvinna. Det är Svenska kyrkan, Se människan som är scenen här till och akt. Och den som le, ska leda det här samtalet det är Sofia Svarvar från ACT, Svenska kyrkan. Så varsågod, Sofia, jag lämnar över ordet till dig. Thank you very much. And this seminar will be in English. Warm welcome to this afternoon and this half an hour. It is dangerous to be a woman. It's not a question. It is a fact. We talk about the hidden pandemic, but it's not hidden, and it should not be hidden. Today, we have invited Sipokasi Jonas from South Africa, a writer, poet, playwright. And we have also invited Anna Charlotta Johansson living half time in South Africa and half time in Sweden, so you are in both places, a writer, and just launched, or a year ago, a book about South Africa on the other side of the rainbow. It's in Swedish. So welcome here. Sipokasi, you have written and also performed in a play called We Are Not Dying Here. It was played on the theater before COVID and then shown on the screen during COVID. We are not dying here. Can you tell us about the story and also the realities that you try to conceptualize in this play? Uh, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for being with us at the end of the fair. I'm sure some of you are quite tired, but uh, we journey on. We really appreciate your attention. Um, thank you so much for this question. So I am part of a collective of three artists, poets, musician, um, actors, theater makers, between the three of us. And um, we, we made a body of work to respond to the trauma of being a woman in South Africa. Um, I believe it was sometime last year where the president said that the rates of gender-based violence uh, and femicide in South Africa actually compare to war zones. So that although our country is not at war, but the statistics compare to, to countries that are. And so that's a really terrifying reality. But beyond statistics, we live with the everyday impact. It's walking in the streets, it's conversations online, it's in relationships, it's in workplaces, it's in churches, it's in schools. Um, and in, I'll try and just keep this part brief. In 2019, there was a, a story of a young student, university student, um, called Uyinene Mkhwetjana, who was brutalized and murdered in a post office. And that is one of the most, I can't even explain the kind of anxiety and, and fear it was palpable um, that we felt in the country. Because although we get constant headlines, we get constant news articles, um, constant hashtags about people who are missing, people who have um, been, you know, who are victims of gender-based violence. But something about the story, I think, was quite a seminal moment in South Africa because the sense of safety was shattered beyond. Even we know we're not safe, but I think thinking about a post office being a site of such, kind of, of such violence, um, was actually the catalyst for this work. 
And so, first of all, we needed the catharsis of being able to come together as artists, make this work and say, we are not okay and we're not okay with having to move on after each story, after each incident um, and never having space to process the trauma. And then um, we, we made the stage production and just before we could really launch it, COVID happened. Um, and South Africa had really strict lockdown. And so the, sta the, the, the film was actually a, a, an opportunity to adapt the stage production and make it available to a wider audience. And really, I think um, I could tell so many stories of, of feedback to this, to this work from women, um, especially a multi-generational kind of experience where families have watched together. And I've, ha you know, I've heard um, people tell me about how their mothers opened up about trauma that they've experienced in ways that they never have before. We had a woman who started um, a support group and self-defense classes in uh, Eswatini, which is a neighboring country. Um, when we screened the film in, in Cape Town, one of the, the, the assistant directors on set actually stood up and said thank you because the work had changed his life, both as a victim and as a perpetrator. So there are so many more, but um, I've seen the place that art can play in making people feel something. Even if it's, you know, we need people that change policies and make the big decisions and sign all the documents. But really for us, art has been about that visceral response to understanding the impact of just, I'll, let, me, let me close this part off like this. I don't walk home, I don't walk at night. As a woman in South Africa, you don't walk at night. Some places you wouldn't even walk during the day. Being here, it was really strange to adjust to the fact that I could. But also I had two conversations with two people that live here who tell me about incidents that they've experienced and where they didn't get the justice. So it's very, very complicated. But yeah, a little bit of introduction into that. Thank you. And it, you already touched upon how art can support and be uh, a way of um, resistance and, and moving forward. But if we just go a little bit, uh, and, and so why, how come, where, where are kind of the root causes for this uh, gender-based violence that it's, uh, Anna, you've been living in the country, what, mm. written this yes. book, what, what would you say? Is it possible to say anything? Oh, that's such an important question, actually, and it's so wide also. But, like, we can never discuss the or the reality of South Africa today or the future of South Africa without taking up the, the history of South Africa. Um, like, living there as a white and as a Swede, I have a huge privilege, and I, I, I think I understand that to some extent, but probably not as much as I should, actually. Um, seeing this, uh, trying to, to write about the modern South Africa of today, the contemporary South Africa, like there are so many positive things also, I must say that, like me also moving from Sweden there is like also a sign of that. Like there's a multicultural, fantastic, strong country, uh, geopolitically interesting, financially strong in many ways, regionally, but also so vulnerable and so uh, weak and corrupt. and that that all those contrasts are important speaking about the the contemporary south africa but also the the violence in the past um that is a generational violence i would say also that it is imagine uh like living in a state um where you are not recognized as a human uh, being where there are other people that have the rights to their own body and to their mind, but not you because you are black. Like, I can't even imagine that. And I think going into a democracy, like where the social reality in many ways is actually the same as before, with, with some possibilities, of course, but the reality of many people are still living in a shack with no electricity and water, uh, where they are, you know, hierarchies in family, and as you say, also in churches, and you know, in, in the society in general, um, where there is actually no possibility maybe to get out of those structures, even if you would like to. Uh, so I think generational violence coming from a past is one, at least, uh, 
yeah, big reason for this. Thank you. Would you like to fill in there about the, the root causes? How, how come this situation about... Mm. Um, I, I completely agree that there is this historical component and it's really significant. Um, but it's also understanding that it's part of... Uh, it's a global issue. I'm thinking about what's happening in Iran today. Um, and there are you know, constant reports that are coming out of protests. Um, so we know that it's systematic. We know that it's structural. We know that it has to do, if we're going to make any kind of dent, it is, has to do with dismantling patriarchy. Thinking about, um, thinking about oppression in terms of the, the, the thinking of capitalism, right? And that, and, and that framework that allows for that kind of ongoing um, oppression. So it's tempting to look at you know, this issue as unique because of some of these um, historical, but I really want us to understand what's happening in South Africa within the context of the fact that it is dangerous to be a woman on this planet, period. We're listening to several um, uh, seminars. It's been amazing to, to, to learn and to hear about the history of South Africa. And uh, like Frank Chikwane, he, he says that we need to, like South Africa is a microcosmos. We need to solve what's there to be able to solve and get justice globally. So, so we need to, to act in South Africa. Uh, we can't isolate. Uh, and it's a, a microcosmos, as he's saying. But what, looking a little bit ahead, what, what are the strategies moving forward? Art is one thing. What more can be done? I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is solidarity. Right? It's important that um, that there is support from different partners, different um, different communities, right? I mean, we've seen the, the place of solidarity in, 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 in dismantling just oppressive power structures all over the world. Um, and a big part of that solidarity for me is thinking about uh, the involvement of men in this fight, in having the conversations together, in rethinking what masculinities are, thinking um, about how they benefit from patriarchy. But I think it's really important um, that we don't carry the burden of that labor because we have been doing, we're speaking about this yesterday in another conversation saying, yes, yeah, women, we're actually tired. We're just so exhausted. You just have to live and try and survive and then still tell people, hey, this is not, this is not cool. There's a line um, in, in, in that work, in, in the stage production that says, we are too tired to tell you how not to kill us. That we end up being the source of how to strategize our own, our own survival. And so I really think that, um, in fact, I saw, I saw a, a video this morning of a man that had, well, I hope it's true, because sometimes things, you know, you see a video, they say it's from somewhere, but it's really not. But seemingly it was a man who had slapped a woman um, somewhere in Iran. And then as he thought he was going to get away with it, but suddenly the whole crowd converged with him and some men dealt with him. And I think it's that is right. We really need, um, we need solidarity across different demographics, across different partnerships. Um, we need accountability, right? Because the big thing is we as South Africa is well known for having a fantastic constitution. We have some great policies, but when it comes to implementation, um, it's a very different story altogether. And I think, um, let me make an example. It, we, we, don't hold, we don't hold people to account. We don't hold... Um, so even though you have these wonderful hashtags, you have hashtag me too, you have hashtag am I next, um, but it seems sometimes those movements die out. Um, there, there was a controversy yesterday about a festival where an artist was headlining, but he had been accused of rape, he'd been accused of murder, but there's no sense of accountability um, that when, when, when these allegations come out and the law does, is really not um, being as effective as it should be. So I think the fact that police themselves, I read a statistic yesterday of, um, I don't know if it was here, but something like 40% of police themselves are also domestic abusers. So how does that frame someone that goes to a police station to actually report that they've been abused, that there are those attitudes already that they have to encounter? So if we don't train, uh, retrain, um, even within those systems, then we are in a lot of trouble. Yeah. I want you to continue, but also to elaborate on where are the safe spaces? 
Have you seen them? But also to add on what she's saying. The honest truth is, I don't know if there are any safe spaces uh, for women um, in general. But I think also it needs to come back to the discussion of rule of law and, as you say, like accountability. Um, like if we can't even trust the institutions that are there to protect us, that we give a little bit up of actually our freedom to have a bigger freedom from police uh, and the government institutions, where should we then go when something happens? Like if I drive my car in Sweden and the police stops me asking for my driving license. I'm never afraid, to be honest, I'm not. If I drive my car in South Africa and the police stops me, I am a bit of afraid. And that's because I'm a woman. Uh, so I would say there is, a, there is also a difference between countries in that sense. But coming back to the, to like, the, it's such an important thing, in fact, for, for also women to feel uh, what do you say, um, to have strength in their own um, capacity, uh, being able to have a job to go to, an income to rely on, with one of like extreme high unemployment rate in South Africa, like this very, it's, it's little a woman can do living in a family when she wants to leave her husband for being violent, for example. Um, so it comes also back to economic development and the rule of law. Uh, and the men today, there's impunity. Like, I, I saw some, some statistics showing that for thousands of gender-based violence uh, accusations, like only a few of them were actually, um, what do you call it, uh, were taken forward, like uh, to be uh, prosecuted or similar. Uh, so the accountability is, is enormous, also from state institutions, but also on individual level. That is not happening today. I do want to add, though, that there's also amazing grass uh, root level work yeah. happening. Um, South Africa has fantastic networks of NGOs that are actually responding to the scourge of gender-based violence. I mean, our film was funded by, by an, um, a, a non-profit organization that does advocacy and they want to use this film to be able to go into these spaces. Um, there are, you know, community, women gather in communities, right, um, to, to, to find different ways, again, when it comes to sort of economic um, independence. So I think there are, um, we have had a couple of national protests, sort of national shutdowns of marching to parliament, marching in the streets um, to speak What's to this. What's the so reaction of, of, of men? Are they included? Do you see the reactions? It's complicated. It's complicated because um, one of the people that was supporting the film is a, is a, is a gentleman who runs a, a, an organization called Langa for Men, right? And that's, a, that's an organization of men that come together, that have conversations. Uh, one of the poets that we're traveling with on this trip works with um, young, young boys, who I think from the age of about 13 to 18. Right in rethinking, creating, you know, having mentorship, um, changing conversations about masculinity and about their place in the world, um, allowing them to feel safe enough to be vulnerable. Right. So there are so many people that are doing that kind of work, and of course, um, and you do have some some men that join in that. There was one that was organized. I'm not sure how that went. Um, there's a there's a there's a body of work called Just for Men, which some artists got together and they made this theater production, and they sometimes have all male audiences so that they can have these conversations mm. together um, so so there's that and of course there are always going to be those who who feel that you know yeah. they're not yeah. positioned so so it's not a, a monolith of how people respond to to this and I think we there are some um, important allies in the work mm. I'm coming from the church it's uh, Act Church of Sweden Church of Sweden that uh, have this conversation here, here with you, and we, we know that within the church it's, it's uh, often a symbol of a patriarchy, but at the same time a voice for, for change. Uh, and we, uh, as Act Church of Sweden, we do collaborate with several organizations in South Africa, Acto Mobano, we speak out movement for gender justice. But I want to hear from you, uh, what can the church and faith leaders do more, and how can they act on this? I want to ask you both that question. You also uh, is writing about the church in your book. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, so the church is very, very present in South Africa. Um, huge also difference to, to uh, Sweden. Um, and I would say that 
civil society, as you say, Sibukazi, like the, the civil society is very, very vibrant in South Africa. It's actually, as I'm thinking also of a, where you have kind of a weak state, you sometimes have a strong civil society and the opposite. That's somehow how I also think of Sweden sometimes. We have a strong government, a strong state, a welfare state, but we have kind of a weak civil society compared to, to South Africa. And that's a, that's a strength uh, moving forward. Um, yeah, so I think that when it comes to churches, uh, some of them are very conservative, I must say that, and uh, seen that also from the inside as a church goer, uh, sometimes I get perplexed uh, of what one can hear in discussions of the man always having to take you know, um, decisions in the household and the woman must follow, etc., etc. So yeah, they. I think the Swedish church, it's, I like that you have collaborations and that's where you must play a huge role in that um, because that's where they can go in the front line actually of, of changing from grassroots level also into family households. Wow, big question. Because yeah. <laughs> um, the history of the church is so extensive, yeah. right? Um, and the church is not one thing. Yes, it's exactly. a lot of exactly. <laughs> This is just shorthand uh, for sort of shared understanding. Um, yeah, oh man, some bad things happen. Some bad things happen. And um, I think there's, there's, firstly, there's space to unlearn, for us as women, to unlearn internalized misogyny. I've seen many examples um, of us underpinning the same structures that oppress us. Um, I remember an incident where, I almost said the name of the church, but. This is live on Facebook. I'll, I'll refrain. Um, but uh, a pastor or an elder had been accused of um, some kind of sexual predation or, you know, just abuse of power within the church. And these young women stood up to protest and, um, you know, talking about it, talking about it, talking about it. I saw something similar that happened in the U.S. And then you heard, had these women in the audience start singing to drown them out until some men pulled them away from the pulpit. And I think that dynamic right there, um, I saw, as I said, I saw a similar uh, thing that had happened in the US again with this pastor who was apologizing um, for his crimes and the, um, the church being quick to forgive on behalf of victims who had not here. So okay, I think we need to be less obsessed with the, um, the redemption arc if I could put it like that, because it's always applied to a perpetrator. There's this, there's this desire to forgive so that we can move on. And no one thinks of the victims. And, or if they do, victims are seen as unforgiving. They're seen as un, you know, not spiritual enough because they couldn't bear the burden. I mean, there's just not, there's no justice. And so I think if there's honesty about um, not using the idea or the theology around grace to actually s suppress the most vulnerable in churches because I believe that that's what happens. There are scriptures to back it up, yeah. right? <laughs> um, and so if people get ostracized, people get moved out and so on. So I think just the honesty within those spaces. Um, but there's probably systematic things as well because I know what happens in South Africa is quite a number of NGOs are funded by churches. And so when there are big you know, policy issues, for example, I keep using the U.S. because they have quite a big presence. Um, if there's something there about abortion, for example, that kind of, uh, those kind of decisions can actually affect whether or not people find, get funding to do the necessary work. So I think, yes. The need for progressive um, uh, thoughts and uh, education within the church and uh, to, to be at the forefront. Uh, and fire pastors who do mm. bad things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We are. We still have a few, a, f a few minutes, and uh, um, when you are coming back, what 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 do you bring with you, and what do you want to to give us to to be able to to strengthen uh, the the women's movement? Mm. I think let us, 
So when, when, we, when we were doing the research for our production, I actually interviewed a soldier, an active soldier, to get some strategies because the, 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 the metaphor of hashtag we are dying here is that it's three soldiers who are in a war. Um, who are trying to survive a war, and that's the war against women's bodies. So we spoke about what it takes to win a war. It was kind of depressing, but one of the big things, um, two of the big things that really stuck with me was he said, unity is important, but secondly, don't compromise the front lines. And I think for me, solidarity is about not compromising the front lines. And that as women, as allies, we need to really ensure that we have a clear sense, I mean, that, that, that we have a clear sense of what we want to achieve and how to get there. That's why I spoke about unlearning internalized misogyny, because sometimes the people, you, yeah. So, so, so don't compromise the front lines. Yeah. Thank you. And Anna, what, what, what's the hope for you? Wow, that's very deep. Can I just say also, everyone who hasn't seen the movie, I saw it yesterday for the first time, and I actually felt physically ill after watching it, and I couldn't stop crying. And that's not so common for me. So uh, it was like you've been able to channel all the pain and vulnerability the South African women feel. Uh, and you have done that very, very well. So an applaud for you and hat off, so to say, for you. And I hope that that movie will be spread all over the world because it's not only a South African, you know, story. Uh, you know, I come back to the situation of actually where, you know, the political situation of, of South Africa is today also and seeing, I, I did a, a series of interviews with ANC members a few years ago on the topic of reconciliation. And they were still waiting for their reparation after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And when asking about reconciliation and what that really meant to them, so to say, actually it came back to having a job, being able to put the kids to school, having access to health care. What we would, from this point of view, say that's actually basic human rights being met, you know. And that has followed me throughout this year, and it keeps on, just reminds me of how important it is to build a society where, you know, you have the access to all these things and you have an economic development based on rule of law where you can have accountability, come back to that discussion. So I take that with me and what I see in South Africa that I get so inspired by is that how the, also touched on the, the art, the music, the spoken words, the poetry, how that is, um, is a method uh, to channel change. Um, yeah, that I take with. And we will end with a poem. Um, this is the title of the poem from the short film. If you want to check it out, we are dying here film .com or we are dying here film on Instagram. Thanks for the hashtag, but there's no time to tweet. Between taxi rank, construction site, and street, there's only enough time to clutch your bag to your body, your body to yourself, and yourself to this thought, please don't talk to me. Please don't talk to me. Thanks for the hashtag, but there's no time to tweet in the office or by the photocopying machine where power pinches the purse strings and makes you a puppet. And everyone knows that the puppet master's hands like to slip below the neck, below the hem, below the waist. But the show must go on, so the audience claps and claps and claps its way to a 13th check. Thanks for the hashtag. But there's no time to tweet, even in vestry and confession booth, where scriptures are interpreted behind smoke screens, between a collar and a robe, and the pulpit is now a bookshelf of bodies because God was cast out a long time ago to make space. So thanks for the hashtag. But there's no time to tweet, even in parliament and court, where they're in the business of cooking laws to serve justice to the vulnerable. But first, a few questions to establish your innocence. Did you say no? Do your clothes say no? Your life, your values, your virtues, how long have you lived as a no? Because what matters is not what you say, it's what he believes he heard. So thanks for that hashtag. But there's no time to tweet. Data is expensive over there and there's no network. And I'd, how do you explain a hashtag or, or, or Twitter for that matter when my grandmother, my aunt and my cousin don't even speak English here? So thanks for that hashtag but there's no time to tweet. 
The police ask what I did to deserve it here. The docket is for sale here. The lecturer will fail you here. The principal is king here. The prophet is father here. The breadwinner must not be questioned here. The bread must not be endangered here. The neighbors mind their own business here. The family says they'll solve this as a family here. They say back as Zela here. They say they want to fix me here. They say don't be clever here. They say smile here. But the trend is hashtag we are dying here. Thank you. Thank you 